the Agric and Agro Allied Committee of IOD. And you're all welcome to this webinar, which is a number in our series on agriculture. Certainly because of the current global environment occasioned by COVID, everybody is looking inwards. And for us, uh, agriculture and its value chain, it contributes about 70% of direct and indirect uh, uh, labor, and is the largest sector in terms of contribution to the uh, GDP. Well, there are lots of interest in agri from everybody, and because of rapid globalization of agri, this has led to new production and distribution systems with new consumption patterns. Currently, there are problems in the agri sector with losses, wastages, and output and underutilization. This webinar is to discuss these challenges in the agri sector and profile uh, solutions. Uh, for us, uh, we welcome those who are just about to venture into agri and also welcome those who are already in agri where we can all have a discussion along uh, these lines. Uh, before we uh, start the webinar formally, let me invite the president and chairman of Council of IOD, in the name of uh, Chris, uh, Chris Okunawa, to formally welcome everybody to this seminar. President, sir. Thank you very much, uh, Chairman of the Agri Committee, um, members of the Governing Council and Executive Committee of the IOD Nigeria here present, uh, distinguished uh, panelists and indeed moderator, fellows and members of the Institute here present, our valued guests, associates and partners. Gentlemen of the press who are here, ladies and gentlemen. On behalf of the Governing Council of the Institute of Directors Nigeria and members of the Institute, I welcome you all to this edition of our webinar series with the theme, Navigating Challenges in the Agribusiness Value Chain in Nigeria. Let me at this point especially recognize and welcome our very distinguished speakers and moderator at this event. First is Mr. Nezuo Uleli, the managing partner of Sahel Capital Agricultural Agribusiness Managers Limited. Second is Mr. Azuka Okofu, MIOD, Managing Director of Bank of Industry Microfinance Bank Limited. Third is Ebele Enua, the uh, MIOG Founder and Managing Director, Sundry Foods Limited. Uh, most distinguished moderator this afternoon is Mrs. Polusha Olaniyo, FIOD, that is Fellow of the Institute of Directors. She's the, pro the Program Director agri Innovate West Africa. This team of experts in their various endeavors bring to us today decades of experience in finance, agriculture, governance, and administration, amongst others. They are highly skilled corporate executives and versatile business leaders. I am indeed very proud to welcome all of you here today to share experience and contribute meaningfully to the discourse. I also wish to welcome all other eminent personalities, guests, associates, and friends of our great institute present at this event. Ladies and gentlemen, as you may be aware, Nigerians' agricultural contribution to GDP makes it the largest sector in the country, and also accounts for about 70% of direct or indirect employment. Despite the huge impact of this sector in the country's GDP, the problem of food scarcity is still being exacerbated by the constant increase in population growth with no complementing increase in the output of agricultural produce. Over the years, it has become a major cause of successful government to provide sufficient food and create an enabling atmosphere for strategic economic development by providing the working population with one of the most important physiological needs. A large share of Nigeria's food supply 
is produced by small and medium scale enterprises, that is SMEs. And the rapid globalization of the agricultural markets has led to generation of new production and distribution systems, as well as new consumption patterns. One of the objectives of modern agriculture is to reduce to the barest minimum the problems associated with agricultural loss, wastages, and the output on their utilization by ensuring an efficient optimization of all the linkages between the producer and final consumer through the agricultural value chain concept. Agribusiness value chains are designed to increase competitive advantage through collaboration in a venture that links producers, processors, marketers, food service companies, retailers, and supporting such as shippers, research groups, and suppliers. However, the Nigerian agricultural value chain has of inherent efficiencies that characterize the elements. In order to optimize effectively the potential embedded in the agriculture, agricultural value chain in Nigeria, we need to continue to engage with all stakeholders and ensure that the right policies needed to strengthen the players of the value chain, value chain mix and revolutionize agriculture as a business entity are developed and implemented. This, ladies and gentlemen, is one of the reasons for this conversation today. Our distinguished directors and leaders, ladies and gentlemen, I wish to accordingly encourage all of us to be open-minded and participate actively in this webinar so as to take advantage of the enormous wealth of experience of our panelists and indeed our moderator. Finally, ladies and gentlemen, I wish to express my special gratitude to all the past presidents of this institute, members of the governing council and the executive committees for their untiring efforts and commitments to the cause of the institute, even in these challenging times of COVID-19 outbreak. I wish to thank the chairman and members of the Agricultural and Agro-Allied Committee of the Institute, as well as, of course, the management of the Secretariat for organizing this webinar. I may wish, I may add that, though, that I wish you would also, at some point in time, in the course of some of these webinars, we invite government um, officials onto the, onto the, onto the uh, panel, or indeed, as, um, as uh, members of the, of the webinar, so that they can actually also learn or they can tell us what the policies are and our members of the panel can react to some of these policies. Anyway, I thank you all for your attention and I wish you a very successful meeting. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, uh, President. So now that uh, the President has formally welcomed everybody, I'm going to hand over to our moderator, Mrs. Felicia Olanio, who will take over from there and handle the proceedings. Mrs. Olanio, over to you. Thank you, Bimbo. And thank you, Mr. President, for giving us the context of today's webinar. Um, we're going to start. The President has introduced everybody, but I would want each of the panelists to give, shed more light on who they are more introductions and their vision for Africa's um, agriculture as it relates to those challenges um, that we have to navigate in the agri sector. So I'm going to start with um, uh, Mezo, but before I ask Mezo to introduce himself, I will tell you who I am. My name is Fulusho Lanio. I'm the program director, Agri-Innovate West Africa. I have um, 30 years experience in the food industry. I started in the food processing and currently I'm backward integrating into agriculture. Um, I work on agribusinesses, we collect data, we organize um, contacts and I am the program director for the biggest um, agri-business trade show 
in this region. I'm delighted to be here and um, I have experiences I would also share in the course of the webinar, but um, let me call Mezwa, who is um, a technocrat and um, is very deep in agriculture from back to front. I'll ask him to introduce himself and share his vision for Nigeria's agriculture in the context of today's webinar. Thank you, Mezwa. Thank you, Mrs. Olanio. Um, uh, I run Sahel Capital. We've been very active in the agriculture sector over the past 10 years. Uh, we've uh, we managed roughly $66 million worth of capital to invest in the sector. We have investments uh, in seven companies in six states across the country, in Kano, Kogi, Anambra, Oyo, Ogun State, Kwara. Um, we've invested in dairy, in rice, in cassava, in poultry, packaging materials, shade, um, broad range of different sectors. Um, our companies have roughly combined um, 2,000 employees, including factory casual workers. We source from roughly um, eight, 9,000 farmers. Um, and in terms of volumes, we've, um, in 2019, uh, companies processed, you know, one and a half million dollars worth of uh, poultry birds for frozen chicken, a couple thousand tons of cassava, huge volumes of rice, so very active across um, different um, sectors. In terms of what motivates and drives us is really to transform um, the agribusiness sector, um, not just in Nigeria, but within the broader, broader region, bringing not just capital, but technical expertise to help scale companies so they can compete on a regional and global basis. And so we look to not only provide capital, but to wrap around that expertise with the companies that we partner with to help them scale. Um, so very passionate about the space and, and very active uh, in the sector um, over the past 10 years. Right, uh, I'll move on to the next speaker. Um, Ebele, can you introduce yourself? Uh, thank you, Pomito. Um, like the president, uh, my son, my, my name is uh, Ebele Inouwa. I'm a chartered accountant, a member of the Institute of Directors. I hold a master's degree from Cornell University, and I founded and run two companies, one Sundry Foods and the other Sundry Market. So Sundry Foods is a food services company which owns um, and operates a chain of restaurants, bakeries, and catering units. And uh, Sundry Market owns a modern retail chain. Um, and I know some of our brands, um, prominent of them being Kilimanjaro, fast food restaurant, and Market Square uh, supermarket. Um, both of these companies sit squarely within the agro value chain on the retail um, spectrum of the, of the value chain. Thank you. Uh, I'll move on to Azuka Okofo, who is um, really the toast of the moment. If he introduces himself, you know why, because we all want funding and the right person to speak to. So, Azuka, yourself. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Madam Moderator. My name is Azuka Okofo. Uh, I work with the Bank of Industry. I work with MSMEs, micro, small, and medium enterprises. Um, currently, I manage one of the subsidiaries, which happens to be the ba uh, Bank of Industry Microfinance Bank. Um, as you're aware, the Bank of Industry is very passionate about uh, the industrialization of this country uh, and agriculture happens to be one of the pivots. We are very passionate about agriculture, the entire value chain. So um, yes, we provide financing as well as uh, business support to the entire value chain. So I'll be here. Uh, it's great to be here, but I'll be speaking more from that perspective. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you. Um, Mezo, I would um, want you to provide a bit of context for the audience. Tell us more about the major challenges in the Nigerian agriculture sector with the experience you have. 
Sure. Uh, I'll take uh, roughly five minutes to do this. So, and, and this context is, doesn't just apply to Nigeria, but to many other countries within um, the region. Um, we have a very large and rapidly growing population uh, in Nigeria in particular. Over the next 10 years, another 70 million people will be added. Uh, between now and 2050, our projections say that we would have 400 million people. And um, we all need to eat. And if we do not address sourcing of food, production of food, um, there's a real risk of food scarcity years down the road. And, or at minimum, much higher food prices than um, you know, what we spend uh, today. And if we look at the statistics, um, the uh, projected demand for food in Nigeria and in Sub-Saharan Africa, um, across all the different value chains, uh, vegetable oils, cereals, meats, uh, pulses, are all expected to grow um, greater than 50%, um, you know, fastest rate of growth uh, compared to South Asia and the world, um, just because of that population growth over the time period. Um, we currently import a large amount of food, whether officially directly through the ports or informally legally across the borders. Um, a broad range of everything from uh, rice to poultry to um, uh, uh, dairy related uh, CPO in edible oils, a broad range including packaged foods. So a huge amount of foods, billions of dollars worth um, imported, not just in Nigeria, but across the West Africa uh, region. Uh, we also have a large amount of people employed in the food economy, roughly 66% of our population is employed in the food economy in some way. Everything from the farming side to the open markets to transportation, retail, formal, informal, processing package, packaging. So a large amount of our population is actively involved in the sector. Uh, but of course, we need more productivity and more um, investment and engagement uh, you know, within the activities that we currently have. Um, we also have a rapidly urbanizing population and also one of the fastest rates of urbanization in the world. I think the only two um, areas uh, urbanizing faster than West Africa is Eastern Africa and South Asia. And this is effectively more people in the cities looking for um, convenience, packaged foods, and also changing of um, food consumption habits that we need to be um, aware of because as people move from rural areas to urban areas, there's also fewer people in rural areas engaged in um, agriculture or agriculture related um, activities. Um, many of you know that we have um, low yields uh, on the production side, limited mechanization, limited use of irrigation. Um, and, and these statistics are in particular in, to Nigeria. Um, other African countries have better statistics than we do, but effectively low productivity. So just by addressing uh, yield issues and not necessarily, so the same farmers cultivating the same amount of land and boosting yields, we can actually double the output that we get and produce as a country. So yield is a, is a major issue. Um, from an export perspective, we tend to export more agricultural commodities and less uh, processed, refined, um, um, value-added ad products. Um, and, and more that export, so which means we're exposed more to um, commodity prices and this limited value capture um, in country. Um, from a financing perspective, which we're going to focus on during this webinar, there have been a number of interventions by the central bank with the uh, commercial agricultural credit scheme with anchor borrowers at single digit rates. Um, but even with these interventions, there's um, only roughly 3% of uh, bank lending to the sector is focused on the agricultural value chain. Some banks have higher ratios than others, but roughly it's um, as a, as a countrywide um, 3%. And this 3% figure also masks that the companies who do get this credit tend to be the larger brand name recognized agribusinesses and not necessarily the smaller SMEs or farmers that might need um, the credit. Um, from an equity capital perspective, we do equity, we don't do debt, um, and there is a need for more equity going to the space and in more innovative types of capital as well. And um, to the degree that um, more players come in to provide this capital, it's a good thing. And I think separate from 
um, capital availability because many companies would state that there is no money available. And if you speak to the capital providers, they will tell you, including us, and I'm sure BOI will say the same thing and many other commercial banks, there is money, um, but the challenge is finding, um, whether you say bankable or companies that are structured well enough to receive this capital in a way that gives comfort to the provider of, of capital. And so I'm sure there'll be some discussion um, around that. And I think what, what our wrap up, um, sort of giving context is that in addition to providing just funding to the space, I think collectively as an ecosystem, we need to figure out how do we provide more technical expertise to wrap around this money, um, you know, whether it's through a farmer extension, uh, whether it's through other types of support, so we can upgrade the uh, inherent um, capacity, skills, sectoral knowledge within our farmers, within our different actors, within the sector. So that um, separate from absorbing just the, the money that's on the table, but so we can scale up and increase the efficiency and productivity of our um, agriculture sector. Thank you, Mesvo. Um, looking at the agricultural sector, the challenges range from finance to production, to processing, to distribution, and sometimes policy somersaults. Thank you, Mezwa, for that insight. Azuka, I'm going to ask you to speak to us on the funding opportunities that exist for smallholder farmers, input dealers, equipment leasing companies, and light value chain enterprises at the Bank of um, Industry Microfinance Bank. And are the lending cycles realistic? Are they friendly to the value chain actors? Uh, yes, thank you very much. <laughs> um, so, because most of the financing in this uh, sector actually comes from uh, the central bank. No, let me say a, a very huge chunk of the financing of uh, agriculture comes from the central bank. It would be nice that we highlight um, one or two things that the central bank has been doing. If that's okay, so the CBN has the Anchor Borrowers Program, which is targeted at providing financing to farmers as group, you know, specific groups and uh, producers specifically targeted in a guaranteed uh, optic uh, modality for from artisanal farmers. So this serves very well uh, for small holder groups when they come together. We have a lot of them scattered around the country, you know. So the CBN provides that financing for them. That are the bank of industry, you know, uh, both for our SME funds and for large. Um, we have a number of funds that are available for uh, for both. So let, let me make this demarcation very clear. So we don't support producers. That's that's basic farming. At the bank of industry, we don't we don't support. So it's when it comes to processing, uh, packaging, distribution. That is when the bank of industry comes in because we are about value add. So for primary agriculture, which is essentially basic pr uh, production, the Bank of Agriculture is well equipped mm -hmm. to do that. So the Bank of Industry is concerned about added value, uh, processing, storage, and distribution. And so we have a lot of funding. The, the funding uh, that we have are there, and people have been coming, they've been assessing it. Just like Ms. Wall, uh, talked about, uh, the, we also have the challenge of if some of these operators will give us enough comfort. It's always, it's been there. So um, we, we have the view that the first thing is not actually financing, but if, if your projects um, from back to back, if we can see where uh, the funding is gonna go into and where uh, the cash flow is gonna come from. Yeah, we want, we want to impact what you are doing. We want to make sure that uh, we process uh, food security is important to us. Um, the country should be able to uh, feed itself, over 200 million people. Uh, we want to see capacity. We want to see uh, raw materials sourced locally. We want to see SS being taken outside the country. They want to ensure that these funds will also come in. They will come back to the bank so that we can also give it out to other people. So he mentioned about bankable projects. 
we have a number of them across sectors, rice, um, we have in oil processing mills, um, we have in poultry, livestock, we have a number of them. And I mean, across the country, and they've been doing well. So the funding is available at the Bank of Industry Microfinance Bank, which is a smaller, you know. So Lagos, we need them, we need them, and its environs enjoy mostly from us all the way to Badagri. No matter how small they are, yes, the funding opportunities are there. If they, if, uh, and we're, our doors are open, that's why we come to this place, that's why we're here. Our doors are open anytime they can approach us and uh, assess it. You talked about the cycles. Yes, the cycles are friendly from as, as low as little as six months to 12 months, up to five years. We have facilities that are tenured for 12 months, up to five years. And because of the sector involved, moratorium is always guaranteed. So if, if, in, if for example, you have to wait for when the producers, uh, you know, the products are out for you to process, to store and to distribute, uh, the facilities are structured in such a way that we, we take companies of moratorium. So yes, the circles are also there and they are friendly. Okay. Thank you, Azuka. Um, Ebele, you run a large consumer facing business. So you deal with um, producers who supply you. You deal with the processors and your process and you also engage in and um, all these come together to form the agricultural value chain template. From your experience, what do you think is um, Nigeria's uh, comparative advantage in agriculture compared to other markets in Africa? And then as you reflect on that sector, what specific opportunities do you think it the agricultural value chains? For Nigerian businesses like the one you run, there are a lot of untapped access to finance. I think as has told us how you can become bankable, is giving us an idea, but I want to shed some light with your experience. What are those challenges? What's the comparative advantage Nigeria has from your perspective as a consumer? Yeah. All right, thank you, Professor. I think um, my understanding is you have that two separate questions. One has to do with comparative advantage, and then the other one uh, talks about opportunities in the agri value chain. I'll take the first one. Um, in terms of comparative advantage, I think I'll summarize them on that three. Three points. Um, first of all, we all know that Nigeria has um, vast arable land. Um, and stand is that 85% of the country's um, uh, land area is arable. And uh, the data also suggests that about 30% of the land um, in, in the ECOWAS region is actually located within Nigeria. So that, that tells us that uh, in terms of um, land needed to, to embark on um, agricultural activities, we have that um, in abundance. Of course, for any productive activity, uh, we know that there are four, four key things that are, that are important. Uh, land is one of them, land, labor, capital, and entrepreneurship. So when you pick one, one very important one, you can have the other three. If you don't have land, um, you really cannot uh, get going. You can import um, capital, you can import entrepreneurship, you can import labor, you can't import land. That gives us, that puts us at a very strategic um, advantage um, in the region. Um, now, also, water. Water is another uh, resource that I think uh, puts us at a comparative advantage, whether it's inland water sources for irrigation purposes. Um, but more importantly, our long coastline, which um, supports the fishery uh, industry, um, both of these uh, are critical. Uh, if, you, if you don't have uh, water to, to irrigate your, your, your land, um, it might impact on, on your yield and productivity on the land. Um, as it relates to fishery, 
uh, we have 853 kilometers of coastline. There are a lot of African countries that are completely landlocked, and so they can't even uh, they can't they can't try to have a fishery industry, for instance. Uh, here in Nigeria, even though we have all that coastline, we, we our fishery industry is actually uh, uh, like a, it's more about so to speak. Uh, we we have been able to domesticate catch catfish farming, but over and beyond catfish farming, we are importing so many other uh, types of uh, you know sea animals out there that that you know form part of that value chain. We have no business importing fish. Uh, our inability to police to police our waterways are uh, probably our greatest undoing in that in that area. Uh, if you just look at the volume of croaker fish uh, roasted in open air bars around the country, that tells you you know its own story. So so that that that, that puts us at a unique comparative advantage. If you can just fix the um, you know the problems limiting us in that area. And then uh, lastly, I'll say uh, why we have. We are able to produce a very wide range of agricultural products in Nigeria, whether it is uh, products of horticulture or animal husbandry. Uh, all of that can be can be it's so wide. When you look at the list of things that can be that can be done here, we have good weather, we have fertile soil, we have the manpower. So I can argue that every product that Africans need can be grown in Nigeria. Some we don't even know yet. There was a time we thought we couldn't grow rice. In Nigeria today, we are, you know, we are forced to reckon with in rice, um, in rice uh, production. Now, this is a compelling proposition for importers, uh, for importers from other African countries who just want to buy everything they need from one source. Uh, from a logistical point of view, that puts Nigeria at advantage position. Now, as it, as it relates to your second question regarding opportunities in the agri-value chain, I've, I've already talked about fishery, for instance, the fishery sector. Um, apart from security challenges there, um, you know, fish, fishing trolleys are very capital intensive. Um, and I start to wonder whether the skill set still exists in Nigeria. Uh, with the demise of, you know, businesses like, like e-book fisheries, for instance, of yesteryear, all the people who were in the fishery industry, you know, two decades ago, where are they? Where has their knowledge and experience gone to? Um, you know, so that that that's a problem. Um, opportunities again. I think there's a significant um, amount of opportunities or volume of opportunities in the dairy industry. Years ago, um, after a thorough study of the ice cream sector, for instance, which we thought to be a multi-billion naira opportunity. Um, that became evident to us. Um, we embarked on a search uh, based on uh, an advice from our technical advisor to go source for fresh milk, fresh milk that contained, it was a very specific uh, requirement, fresh milk that con contained 3% fat. Um, this was going to be a very, that, this, was, this was the major input for being able to produce ice cream from scratch. Our research took us to Shanghai Farm in, in Kwara State, where one of you know two or three professional dairy farms in Nigeria existed at that time. I don't know if there, there are more dairy farms you know now in Nigeria. Um, and what we found is that that particular farm, dairy farm, could not produce enough milk to even satisfy five percent of Friesland um, Campinas needs in Nigeria. Five, not even five percent. They couldn't meet that demand. So, talking of trying to service us, you know, um, and, and of course, prison is just one of the numerous uh, male producers in Nigeria. So, what, what we learned there at that point was that almost all the milk we consume in Nigeria today is imported in, in dry, powdered form, and and that's not that's not good. It was a very, needless to say, a very disappointing end to our research, and that's how. You know, that, that whole um, business idea fell apart. We just couldn't stop the increase here. Um, we understand that Nigeria consumes a relatively small um, fraction of dairy products compared to the rest of the world, similar to what you have with sugar. Um, there was a research that suggested that, you know, in terms of our consumption of sugar in Nigeria, we, we consume a, a small fraction 
compared to other countries in the world. And that, that tells you that perhaps the opportunity in, in dairy is even as large as the opportunity um, that, that the likes of Dangote and soya meals are found in, 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 sugar in sugar production in Nigeria. Um, another area I think will be um, you know, storage, including cold, cold storage. Every year around this time, we, we start to experience shortages in vegetables, for instance, tomatoes, carrots, and things like that, lettuce. Um, price of yam shoots up because old yam goes out of season. New yam, which is less tasty, comes into season. Um, this year, plantain price has gone up. I'm sure we can all relate with this. It's gone up by maybe 100, maybe 150 percent, maybe 200 percent. I'm not trying to do the math. What's the cause of these shortages? Disruptions in the supply chain, simply. Um, storage can solve that problem. Storage is land intensive, which is inadvertently um, capital intensive. One wonders um, how can value be extracted by injecting storage into the value chain. Without an answer to this question, it is an unbankable um, idea. Yes, it is critical for the sector, in order for the sector to achieve its full potential. Um, fertilizer, for some weird reason, uh, there seems to be an insatiable demand for fertilizer in India. We used to import a lot of this, apparently. But now, um, so many large businesses are getting into local production. Notori, you know, was the first out of the door. Uh, Indorama, which is one of the largest uh, petrochemical companies in the world, um, also, you know, jumped into the fertilizer business. Dangote has jumped in. And more recently, we hear of Morocco's OCP commissioning a plant here in Nigeria. What do they see? Um, they see opportunity, and I think as the um, agricultural industry continues to grow, um, there will be a lot more opportunity out there. Um, modern retail markets, uh, you know, that's my space. This is capital intensive. It requires huge investment in prime, expensive um, property, landed property, state-of-the-art refrigeration, HVAC um, equipment, and information technology. A standard, a typical standard modern retail store of, say, size 2,000 or 3,000 square meters can easily cost a billion naira. And research suggests that Nigeria can take 500 of such stores. What is that? Opportunity. Investors are needed in the retail real estate sector, uh, which has traditionally been ignored. Capital is needed to create capacity and fund development of energy efficient refrigeration and HVAC systems, suited particularly for the Nigerian market. You know, so that's again um, another opportunity. Forest management, whatever happened to rubber plantations of yesteryear? What happened to our wood industry, which is uh, the backbone of the furniture industry, you know, that kept uh, places like Sapele booming? Are we suggest suggesting that the world no longer uses or needs rubber? The world no longer uses wood. I mean, if you look around, you see wood all over the place. And the question I ask is, where is that wood coming from? Are we importing wood? Most likely, we are importing wood. Uh, foreigners are making a killing in palm plantations in Nigeria. I can go on. There's so much opportunity. But I, I'm sure I don't have all this. So I'm going to stop here. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, we've listened to three of you speak a lot of um, what you've spoken about has, to, has addressed um, funding, it's addressed um, distribution, it's addressed storage. And um, we've not said much about infrastructure because today artificial intelligence is what is used in developed countries to monitor farmlands, to track um, the, 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 the growth, to track harvesting, to track even planting seasons. So artificial intelligence is key, and um, it's been seen to improve and enhance productivity significantly. But there's a problem that um, we have in Nigeria, which is infrastructure. This cuts across um, transportation, storage, and power. And um, before I ask Mezo to enlighten us on crowdfunding, which is an innovative source of funding for small businesses, I want him to shed some light on 
how to navigate um, the rough terrain, looking at the infrastructure levels in Nigeria, which is um, slightly below the acceptable standard. How can you navigate this challenge in the Nigerian agricultural sector? How do you do it? Because I know you sit on boards of agricultural processing companies, you own one. So give us some tips on how you navigate this difficult terrain. Ms. Zou. So thank you. So it's a very important um, issue that you've raised because it's also one that is difficult for the private sector to address directly. And it definitely needs um, a federal government, state government support, whether directly or in partnership with the private sector. Um, but it's infrastructure related items can be game changers for the country. And when, when I talk, think of infrastructure, it's rural roads. Um, how do you, if, if you're producing a crop and you can get your crop to key markets in a, an efficient way, it has implications on pricing, on, on farm gate losses, huge implications. And many of the international markets have very well developed rural roads to take out crop from rural areas. So rural roads is, is very key. A, another one is irrigation. Um, irrigation allows you to do multiple cycle in a year farming, uh, not just rain fed farming. It only increases um, security of harvest uh, because you're not tied to the rains and to weather. Um, it also increases farmer income directly because what you find with many farmers today is that they farm and then when they're not farming, they have side jobs, side hustles, other things they're doing to earn income because it's farming is not year round. And you have breadbasket states like um, uh, Benway, for example, that um, to get food out of th those breadbasket states or even to get processors to, processors to operate there is very tough because if you're producing there, how do you get your food rest of the country? So irrigation, very key, um, boost income yields, rural infrastructure, very key and requires quite a bit of capital spend to go into it. So, you know, when we hear um, budget allocations from the federal government to buy uh, mills, uh, we don't necessarily need more support to buy mills. We need more support on the things that are hard to, to finance. Now, if you're a private company navigating, as many entrepreneurs and business owners on, on this call are aware, it just adds to your cost of doing business. So transportation costs are very high. It's cheaper to get a container from China to a Papa port, then to then move that same container from a Papa to Kano. So um, transportation costs are uh, much higher. Um, and I'm not even speaking about power related. So I think the short answer is that it um, just adds costs to doing business. But if we're looking for um, key game changers that can impact the sector, um, definitely infrastructure related that is very high up on the, in, on the list. Even before we get artificial intelligence, et cetera, very important, but there are key things we need to do in our infrastructure to address um, sector performance. Now you also mentioned um, crowdfunding. And I think there, the way I think about it is that there are new innovative types of capital coming to the sector. Um, uh, crowdfunding, though, is, is, has new regulation and we'll see increased regulation in the years ahead. And I think the, re the regulation is, is good if, it, if it's done in a targeted manner. And I think it's really trying to balance between those that want to provide capital to the sector and are willing to provide capital. And then the entities that are managing that money, do they have enough uh, risk management um, uh, processes in place because um, as a crowdfunding entity ultimately at some point you begin to look more like a banking institution and you need to be have good risk management in place and then separate from just providing the money you need to make sure you're wrapping um, uh, te technical assistance around um, the people who are receiving this capital to ensure that they can actually they have what it takes to actually scale and grow so specifically around crowdfunding, I'll, I'll, I'll characterize it as it's good to have more innovation around how to provide capital to the space. Um, separate from um, crowdfunding, you also have interesting groups like uh, Cellulant and others who are, um, because of their tech, because of the database of farmers, can potentially also be in a position 
to provide um, working capital to farmers. And we're going to see more technology enabled solutions as we uh, move forward. But I think overall, um, that movement and direction is positive. And so that there's a broader pool of um, people that um, farmers and companies can um, access capital from. Thank you. Azuka, how can agribusinesses take advantage of the funding opportunities you and Mr. Woneli have mentioned? And is BOI Microfinance Bank positioning for the Free Continental Trade Zone Agreement implementation? Can we have your views? Yes. Um, so, um, Taking advantage of some of the funding opportunities available to uh, to operators in this uh, subsector, the first step will be to uh, to know the various options and types of financing that are available to agri businesses. So as soon as you uh, identify them, you determine which funds closely match what you're doing. There are lots of funds. We we'll, we'll talk about the uh, CBN anchor borrowers. Uh, there are some that the uh, Bank of Industry has for processing. Uh, before now, we used to have uh, cassava fund, bread fund, or rice. Uh, yes, so you need to know which, 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 uh, which part of the value chain you're playing to know which fund closely matches yours. Then contact the relevant uh, offices or agencies. If it's the Central Bank, if it's the Bank of Industry, if it's the Bank of Agriculture, if it's BOI Microfinance Bank, um, you contact us. So, and the next step will be to, like Ebele has said, Amizo, you get the documentations, you know, uh, get out all the uh, documentations, ensure that um, you meet all the terms, all the terms and conditions for the financing, and then um, you apply. It's straightforward. Um, after assessing the funds, one thing we also should ensure is to make sure that um, the disbursed funds and the amounts. Uh, for these enterprise or for these operations are used specifically for what you know they are meant for. You know, so that we don't have the issues of uh, diversion coming on because we have plenty of that everywhere. You you also mentioned if uh, the Bank of Industry or BOI Microfinance Bank is well positioned for after. Yeah, so after aims to accelerate uh, the growth of inter Africa trade and uh, using trade as an engine for growth. So yes, um, what it means for us is that uh, our customers' uh, products can actually go to more markets besides Nigeria, you know. And so um, one of the Ms. was talked about the large corporates getting most of the funding. Uh, that's true to an extent because they they position themselves such a way that they are bankable. That's one fact. They will also have small small uh, holders that could come in form of groups. You know, so um, yes, I want to meet, once you meet the conditions and the terms, why, why not you take advantage of it? So yes, um, they, there are more credit facilities for uh, customers, you know, since we want to actually support and further stimulate the sector. Thank you. Thank you. Ebele, what specific actions do a Greek value chain actors need to take in terms of um, technology, logistics, and post-harvest losses? Oh, thank you. Uh, for the to improve uh, their productivity. Thank you. Um, now, I would Particularly as it, as it pertains to um, reducing post-harvest losses and increasing productivity, um, I would recommend, you know, three possible paths that, um, you know, value chain actors can, you know, can take. One, I call this aggregation, you know, aggregation may be an answer. Um, you know, if there are no ready-made value chain logistic providers, for instance, then perhaps some key players can come together to provide a solution in a JV structure um, that will be creating an animal that they can even spin off later or IPO. 
Um, you know, that, that could be a, a possible solution. Uh, the second one is what I call adoption, you know, as a, as a solution. For those um, that are structured and already successful in the industry, they can prepare a compelling case and present to someone providing similar services already for another industry or somebody providing similar services to the general public to convince them to pivot or extend into theirs. So for instance, you take what Jumia and Conga did when they launched e-commerce you know, in Nigeria years ago. Um, they approached DHL, UPS, and FedEx to provide last mile logistics services for e-commerce. I mean, why haven't the agri value chain guys thought about who can we approach to, to provide, you know, to invest in and provide specialized storage and logistics services for, for our business? Um, so adoption could be a solution. And the last, the last option I probably have to suggest is for them to invest in the solution themselves. If you have scale or you are trying to build scale, and you see the limitations caused by these ancillary services, you need to plan for it as part of your rollout plan, as part of your expansion plan. Um, for instance, in our case, um, there was an absence of ready-made um, retail premises, which prompted us to raise capital Hello. Hello. Sorry, I lost connection there. Hello. Yes, Abele. You can go. Sorry, I lost connection. What was the last thing you had me say? So I pick it up from there. Just start from the last point. Hello? Okay. Um, are you back on? Yes, I am. Yeah, just go back to the last point you started. Um, I, I know I talked about aggregation and then I went into adoption where I gave uh, examples of Junior approaching DHL FedEx to provide last mile logistics services. Did you, did you get that before I, before I moved on? Okay, so I was, I was now talking about investing. Yes, in yes, um, so they can invest in a solution themselves um, where you are trying to scale up or you're trying to build significant scale in a business. And you see the limitation caused by these ancillary services. You need to plan for it as part of your rollout or expansion. For instance, in our case, the absence of ready-made retail premises prompted us to raise capital to build out our own real estate as part of the plan to build a sizable retail business in the shortest possible time. Dangote had, a, had, had to build power plants alongside his cement factory when it was obvious to him that he couldn't achieve the skills he needed by relying on PHCN or on regular generators, you know? So, um, you know, a key player should consider rather than folding his hands and thinking, oh, there's no opportunity, you know, the opportunity to, to scale up is limited by the absence of these resources. Um, you know, there's a solution. Invest in those solutions yourself and service yourself. And in so doing, you might actually build, you know, an ancillary business that are, can also, you can also spin up, you know, as a business of its own, um, you know, as you go along. So those three, those three are, are what I would 
those are those are three things I can advise. Okay, thank you. I'm going to take um, Uzube Okeze's um, question. He said, we have a huge army of young people in Nigeria whose energy can be channeled into the agricultural value chain. From your experience, what are the real entry barriers and how can we young people overcome them? Meso. Sorry, Meso. sorry, my, yeah, sorry, my signal faded out um, for a second. So there was a question you said that, um, if you don't mind repeating the question again. Yeah, we have a huge army of young people in Nigeria whose energy mm. can be channeled into the agriculture value chain. So from mm. your experience, what are the real entry barriers and how can young people overcome them? Sure. And I, I think there, there, there are many different points of, of entry, but I think also um, uh, people should be aware that they can, uh, and I strongly recommend um, everyone to start small. So you learn from small mistakes before you begin to scale versus the default by many people which feels that they need a lot of money or a loan or some capital to provide. Um, it starts in a major way. And, and I mentioned this because you know, when we first um, started um, Ace Foods many years ago, 10 years ago, we literally started with a rented location in Ojokoro and a 20,000 Naira local grinding machine just to understand what was going on before we began to scale. So the, if, if you decide that you want to be an entrepreneur in this space, strong advice is to start small as you learn the business. Um, at the same time, um, there are many agribusiness firms who are looking for smart young people to join the firm in many different roles. Um, everyone from Sundry Foods, I'm sure, is looking for, for talent across his business to um, other companies in, from input providers, processors, packaging, so it's to um, pay attention and realize that outside of banks, outside of oil and gas companies, telecom companies, there's a broad range of food processors and manufacturers that could be an entry point. Um, and you don't necessarily need to be an entrepreneur. You can, you can be that talent that the company needs to grow and scale. Um, but should you decide to be an entrepreneur, um, it starts small. Um, there are a broad range of sectors that there are opportunities in. And, um, and to build from there. Um, but I'll pause because it's, it's a very general question and I can go, not sure which aspect to go into more depth, but I would say start small um, and also realize that your passion and talent could be useful for another company in that space. And, and I will say that there is, um, and I, I do know at least uh, one case, and I know there are several, of individuals who started working at um, agribusiness firms and then six, seven years later, um, actually bought out those agribusiness firms. And there's one individual in particular I'm thinking about in the poultry sector who started 15 years ago as an employee and then um, bought out the um, uh, foreign owners as they were le leaving, borrowed money, bought, bought them out, and has a business that is multi-billionaire uh, business today. So um, there's a path and the, you, and the path can change over time. But I think the key thing is just to just to just start. Okay, thank you. Um, another question from Ijoma Jidenma. She believes governance is a major issue for entrepreneurs involved in agribusiness. This vital sector has to be run as a business that is that is truly covering areas such as proper structure skills. And these are the factors that will guarantee the proper record keeping. Right. Um, her question, really, I think she's just put her a, a opinion forward. But I want um, Azuka to contribute to that opinion. Um, the issue of governance has been a major issue for entrepreneurs involved in agribusiness. Yes. <laughs> Um, let me let me thank uh, Jelena for for that uh, contribution. So we were talking about uh, bankable projects. I mean, they are all linked together. Keeping of records, uh, corporate governance, treating the business as a separate entity. You know, from uh, uh, you as an individual. So, um, so we, we may as well talk about starting very small. Let me let me go to that side. So um, it's not every time that you need to take a loan to start a business. 
no matter how small it is. So from your own savings, from family and friends, you start from there. Then when you see that you're scaling up or when it's growing, that's when you begin to now uh, look for financing or look for, for, for loans. Now, before that, or in the process of looking for loans, the issue of if you've been keeping proper records, uh, corporate governance, if you've been, you know, if they can look at the project, your uh, business and say it's bankable, all those come into it. So for agriculture as a whole, um, we have that issue. Um, we have lots of small older uh, farmers, you know, in this, who play in that sector. So we, we should not look at agri like it's meant for those in the villages or uh, for it as a retirement plan. Agriculture is, is knowledge based, it's knowledge driven, you know, so um, it's, it's, it's important that if you are going to that business, even when the financing, everything is from your own pocket, from your savings or from family and friends, because you don't know what's, what's going to happen down the line. So corporate governance is essential, proper record keeping, accounting, everything. It's what we, we've been advocating that uh, operators actually are there to. Thank you. Thank you. There's another interesting comment from that I want um, Ebele to shed some light on. He said, um, agribusiness in Nigeria is yet to mainstream weather events and their impact on productivity, especially on food loss. It seems fitting to articulate thoughts on this as many food producers are very vulnerable to weather events and there is no robust insurance yet to address the issue of mitigation against losses. Ebele, what do you think of this and what are your views? Um, I mean, I, I think uh, Nigeria is actually blessed in a, in, in a lot of ways um, when it comes to the weather. First of all, I think the weather, you know, I mentioned earlier that our weather is, is very good for agriculture and this is what also contributes to the fertile nature of our arable land. But the other angle to, to, agri to, to our weather, which I, which I find um, you know, very, very pleasing, I guess a lot of people who are in the agro space will find very pleasing, is that we don't have natural disasters. You know, you wouldn't hear of an earthquake here or a tsunami or a landslide. Or, I mean, we don't, we don't hear of those things and we are so blessed in that regard. So, um, yes, there are some weather events that can impact negatively on um, on your produce, but it can be it could it can be worse. It is worse in a lot of other parts of the world. And the simple solution to that really is insurance. Um, you know, the insurance industry will will insure you know your 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 product. So if the agri if the agri industry haven't considered insurance as an important part of of their um, business structure or system, um, then they will certainly be open themselves up to, to such weather related losses. If, if I can add to Abele's comment, um, and then I do agree with him that we don't, we're not faced with many of the same natural disasters that some other countries face. Um, but I think from a weather perspective, there are really two issues. One is there's no rain, um, and you're faced with drought related issues um, or unpredictability of rain. And, and that's when uh, irrigation makes a huge difference. So you're not dependent on rain-fed agriculture. And the other is that there's too much rain, um, either where you farm or upriver, that floods your farm. And I think on the flooding side, uh, every single year, the past four years, um, different parts of Nigeria have, have faced flooding incidences, uh, some large, uh, and usually along the niger Benue River all the way down south. I know one of our uh, companies has faced this issue a couple times over the past um, couple years in, in Anambra. And um, it has huge impl implications where you put a lot of money into your farm and you're now waiting for harvest and then it gets destroyed. And even if you're a small farmer, um, there are huge implications as well. So it's a big issue. Now for insurance, um, there act is actually insurance, um, but it's not well developed. There is input insurance, which covers the cost of your input and not market value. And that's more common. Uh, many people don't, um, many farmers don't use it uh, or the banks that, the banks require Nike uh, for coverage. A different issue is whether Nike would actually pay you if there's an event. 
Um, there is yield-based insurance, which is new in the market, uh, developed by a uh, group called Pula in partnership with Nurso. And uh, firms like Leadway, Ico, and others will provide you lead, um, yield-based insurance. So, um, but I think there needs to be more um, mitigating products put in the market to protect those that farm uh, to mitigate risk. Um, because even though there are few incidences of risk in general, just one incident can destroy your entire business. Yeah, Mezu, this question is specifically for you. How are agri processors working to obtain preferential availability from power distribution companies to ensure the much needed electricity to power their facilities? <laughs> this is a tough one. And I'll say frankly that um, those that have uh, priority access or are on priority lines, frankly, um, either are located such that they're in close proximity and can connect or have the right relationships that allow them to get that priority access. But for the majority of actors in the space, it's very difficult. Um, but at the same time, I think um, what um, agro-processors can look at is um, are there, so depending on the sector you're in, so if you're in rice, you're in shea, um, you're in cashew, you could potentially use the waste byproducts uh, from your um, processing operation to also power your plants or at least the boilers. So there's some renewable power type stuff that you can use. Um, but for direct access, um, as we know, a lot of it is relationship based. Um, but frankly, I would say probably that even though power is um, an issue, it's not probably the biggest issue that many people face. Um, I noticed, and maybe I'm jumping the gun, but I noticed that one of the questions was around security. And, uh, and, and I'll probably say that security is a bigger issue more than anything else. And it impacts us directly, and I can tell you a few stories, and it impacts farmers in general. So the way to think about security is, if you're a small farmer in Borno State, that is a breadbasket state, or in Katsina or Zamfara, and you are afraid to go and farm, that actually reduces the volume of food and crop coming into the market and impacts the food prices we face. So as a small farmer in a security impacted area, um, it's a major issue because it, it impacts us ultimately in Abuja, Lagos, because we pay for it in terms of higher food prices. If you're a commercial farmer um, or a business owner, um, it raises major implications. So in at least um, two of our companies, in two different states, we have a very high uh, mobile policeman army bill just to protect our operations. And we should not have to allocate budget to engage police and army to protect our operation. We should not. And our situation is not unusual. I'm sure you can name any large, major brand name agriculture sector player in Nigeria. And the security budget that they have is huge. And this is money that takes away from capital expenditure spend on, on your farm. And this is um, kidnap prevention. This, I mean, this is a range of different things you, you, you have to deal with. So it adds to the cost of doing business. And even if you're looking for investor capital, we've been engaged in conversations with other investors. And a key question for them is, what is the security situation in Kaduna, in Katsina, in name the state that you want to invest in? And if they are concerned about security, if their expatriate technicians cannot go, if you as an individual are uncomfortable going to those states or you will only go with Mopo, then it has implications on whether you would invest or scale your investment in, in that state. So it's, it's, it's even more so than power. Security is, it has huge and major ramifications, not only for small farmers, but for commercial investors who want to engage um, in across the country and in the sector. Okay. Thank you, Mezo. Um, we're going to now, I'm going to ask each of the panelists to, you know, imagine you're speaking to the people in government, to those who have a role in policy formulation. What aspects of the Nigerian agricultural value chain is lacking in terms of um, policy cover. 
what policies do you think need to be reviewed? Because sometimes we realize some policies have been on for 30, 40 years, and they need to be made smart based on current situation. So what policies do you think need to be revisited or developed as it relates to primary production, processing, funding, and distribution? So just choose any aspect of the value chain and policies that you think need to be put in place to support the agricultural sector. So I'm going to start with Azuka. Um, um, be, be, sorry, Madam, before I take your question, um, can I go a little bit to talk about uh, the insurance that we actually have a very robust uh, insurance for, for this sector. We have Lysal and we have Nike and they are doing excellently well. Even though uh, it looks like they, are, they, they were set up for big uh, corporates, but smallholders uh, can also approach them. They're doing excellently well. And um, insurance, we consider insurance as a key component of the business, sincerely. So um, to your question now, um, what, what I would like to see is, um, um, a sustainable macroeconomic policy that is pro-investment in the entire agricultural sector. I don't know if I'm communicating. So, in, yes, investment to the producers or in production, investment in processing, investment in storage and in distribution, so that within a very short while, uh, the country can be food sufficient we can actually attain food security. That's a summary of what I would like. Uh, if, if I were to be in a decision of policy making, you know, but from the perspective of the Bank of Industry as well, or, or the Bank of Industry Microfinance Bank, we also want to support all the players, all the operators as much as we can, so that we can actually be food sufficient. We can actually source our local material, our materials locally before we even talk of exposition. Thank you very much. Okay, before I move on to Ebele, I want to ask a question that I've seen here. Taking into account poor infrastructure and smallholders who are not eligible for the ABP, they do not have access to microfinance loans. Are there proven and effective payment structures or systems which allow smallholders to pay for agricultural services, such as laboratory, soil, and fertilizer testing services upfront. So I'm directing that to you, Azuka, because you are the banker. Yes, yes. Um, <laughs> so it, it doesn't matter what, how small the player is. Microfinance loans across the country are available to them. So the Bank of Industry as a whole supports other microfinance banks. I mean, we give them, uh, we extend on lending facilities to them to impact certain sectors and agriculture is part of them. So it doesn't matter how small the amount, uh, they can come in group or they can go individually. They can assess this uh, uh, funding, they can assess financing. And yes, uh, test, uh, soil testing um, and what is the other one, they are all available. Yeah, all available. Okay. So I, I think I think what what they need to do is to actually approach those who can or who have been doing it. Okay. Well, I think his question is laboratory soil and fertilizer testing services. Um, you know, is there a provision, an effective payment structure or system which allows these people to pay for these services upfront? You know, you have to do your soil testing and um, lab analysis before you go into huge investments. So do you have a window, like an ante room, where these services can be funded upfront before the major project itself? I think Ms. Wall should take that question. <laughs> so thank you, Azuka. So, yes. so I, 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 I would say that I, I think there, there are two issues. One is the, the cost and availability of that service and then how to fund it. 
So on the cost and availability, there are, um, so a lot of soil, big soil testing is actually done outside Nigeria. So samples sent outside Nigeria to Kenya and a few other places. But I know that um, if I'm not mistaken, Flour Mills was testing handheld technology in Kaduna states and a few other Northern states that could give um, soil test analysis at roughly $10 equivalent, if I'm not mistaken. And the question is for that low cost, cheap, um, uh, affordable testing, uh, how to get that to more farmers so that they can uh, actually access it. But um, the reality is most farmers are not testing soil there and most farmers are not using improved seed. They're planting last year's grain. Um, but to the, ultimately, I think the, the question is really looking at how do you work, how do farmers get services to enable them boost their yields? And I think the, the first step I would recommend is um, cooperatives. The farmers that have organized themselves into well-functioning cooperatives find it easier to get services, whether it's mechanization or financing, than farmers who are not organized in well-structured cooperatives. Then once you then set up yourself into a well-structured cooperative, it's then easier as well to then engage with um, a range of partner off-takers. So for those, uh, and, but this is not easy uh, with all crops, it's easier for grains um, versus other crops. But then if you're doing grains especially, then the question then is as a farmer cooperative group is to identifying the big buyers of your crop and seeing how to partner with them for financing and other services. Because if you have an off taker that um, is happy with your volume of your crop, they, you, they tend to also wrap around other services. So I know with at least one company, we've engaged with um, farmer cooperatives, link them to microfinance financing and guaranteed uptake. And without microfinance financing as well, there's been an insurance product that's been wrapped around the microfinance because if unfortunately the farmer passes away, the life insurance policy also helps cover the obligation. Um, there's also services and extension that the off-taker would um, help provide. So the first step recommendation is um, you need it to be organized into a well, and I, I'm stressing well-functioning organized cooperative. And then with that entity, it makes it easier to then engage for a broad range of services that you may, you may need um, to, to access, whether it's soil testing or mechanization or financing. Thank you, Mezo. Um, Ebele, as a player, this is a question for you in the retail end. Can you please enlighten us on the management of stock and minimization of losses for fresh food and expired Process. All right, thank you. Um, the, and the simple answer to, to that, you know, it, everything always starts with planning um, and data. Um, if you know what your likely demand will be, you can then plan your procurement or your production so that you, you ensure you minimize um, your losses at the end of the day because we're, we're dealing with products with very short, short uh, shelf life. Um, ev almost every um, agro product is a perishable, that's what we call it. It's, it's likely that if you, don't, if you don't use it or you don't sell it that day, um, you know, it's going to get bad. So the question at the beginning of every day you should ask yourself is how many of these products are you likely to sell today? And based on data that must have been extrapolated from, you know, um, from history, and then you plan your production or your procurement to meet that demand. And of course, where there is a, an overage or whatever it is, you, you have to discard the stock. There's really nothing else you can do. So there's an acceptable level of loss that is uh, typically allowed for in, in every retail operation. And over and beyond that, there is a planning problem that needs to be solved. Yes, there's another question from Sadiq Kazim. The ABP is available to smallholders through a crop association. Companies and business organizations can access only through the prime ABP. The problem has always been the bank's conditionalities, which are difficult for SMEs to meet. The large and established corporates have a track record and a balance sheet to show, while the others, especially startups, don't have this. 
Are there any facilities available for the small businesses, whether or not they have been long in operation or as startups? Um, Azuka should take this. Um, for startups in agriculture, um, so we, 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 for any business, we want to see um, if you are a startup, we want to see that part of your experience is that you've worked uh, in a similar outfit or similar operations. We, we, we learned to startups. But we want to see that you've, you've spent four years, seven years, eight years in that same operations in a different entity. So now that you're about to start up your own business, why not? Financing is available for you. But if you've not, if you don't have any track record, if you've not done any of this job in the past, and of course, you know Nigeria, so um, the period we are now, there's COVID, and the entire cultural value chain is booming. Then somebody who has been a fashion designer or who has been an investment banker comes to you and says uh, he wants to start egg distribution. He's not done egg distribution in the past. You know, so it's a challenge for me as a banker. I want to ask you, have you done egg distribution before? He says, no, but that people are distributing eggs now. They're you don't know the dynamics, the intricacies involved in it. So as much as we, they're, they're financing available for this sector. I, we keep saying it, but um, there are terms and conditions to be met. Once those terms and conditions are met, we are good to go. Thank you. Thank you. And then from John Sojay, pleased to see the progress made across the value chain of the agri sector. The government has a key role in helping to create an enabling environment. What are key barriers, if any, attributed to government policies or laws? Are governments on, say, land use uniform across the states? The land use laws, are they uniform across the states? I don't know who wants to take this out of all the panelists. Um, I will give a, a perspective from um, our own experience Thanks. since we are in six different states and we've had to deal with land issues. Um, so I'll speak with just knowledge from those states. And I think, frankly, so one, one issue is what the laws themselves state. And the, the, the other is actually um, being able to actually get title in, um, you know, in, a, in an efficient manner without doing anything inappropriate. And I think that's the biggest challenge. And, um, and I know in one particular case, uh, it took five years, uh, if not six, seven years before we got um, uh, COVO, um, even just because we were trying to follow process. I mean, in another state, um, we had the land allocation given by one governor and then an incoming governor and the process, uh, bottom line, we had dif difficulty getting some things honored. And then in other states, we've had no problems at all. So it's effectively a mixed bag. And, but I, I won't speak to the, I'm not a lawyer, so I won't speak to the legal specific issues, but our state separate from the legal issues is actually ensuring that um, you can get proper implementation in a timely manner of um, an agreement that you want without um, anything inappropriate. And I think that's where the difficulty actually is. Thank you. Um, there is a question to Azuka. What do you suggest the logistics sector players do to attract financing from the BOI? Logistics. I'm very sure this person knows that BOI is very advanced to logistics. <laughs> so and um, I mean and it's not it's not um, it's born out of experience. So um, we we want we want to we finance businesses that we can actually manage very very well that we have expertise on. You know so and uh, the vagaries in, uh, that are very common with logistics makes it you know a very challenging sector for us. So it has to be a policy issue for us to start playing in logistics. But we have a subsidiary that plays in logistics. That's their sole business. 
So if if uh, if this if this if the person asking this question is actually playing that subsection, the person that can actually approach us. We have a subsidiary, Lecon. It's called Lecon. That plays only in logistics, not BOI itself. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. And then what are the key factors to consider when going into relationships with foreign technical partners, especially with technology and knowledge transfer? So that should be answered by Mezwo and Ebele. Happy to go first. Um, I think it's frankly a case by case basis um, that you need to evaluate the specific requirements that you have. And, um, you know, and, and I think my, my default approach would be to, uh, in quotes, buy or hire talent um, and then embed into your organization and then build from there versus potentially a JV, which could be more expensive. But, um, um, and I think the way we've approached it in our different companies is where we have a particular requirement or need for uh, certain technical expertise. We spend a lot of time with headhunters and HR firms trying to find wherever that talent is, whether in Nigeria or in other African countries or outside the continent to bring that talent in. And that's what we, we tend to focus on. Um, we've, we've also had, um, uh, I think the other area, and, and this is into chief operating officers, people that run factories, agronomists, farm managers. And I think where it's been a little bit more difficult is farm equipment maintenance, where you have very um, expensive, huge, um, you know, combine harvesters, et cetera. And, um, and there you, you need to have maintenance contracts with um, technical experts, um, but we always try and see how to build that in-house um, capacity. So you should be very attentive to this. Otherwise, you'd have huge cash leaving the business um, just to address um, this particular issue. Okay, Ebele would go next. Briefly. Sorry, you might have to repeat the question. Let me get the question very well. Okay. That what are the key factors to consider when going into relationship with foreign technical partners, especially with technology and knowledge transfer? One minute and that. Okay, I mean so the the, the I mean the the question would always be whether whether you, you really can you you really need a technical partner, um, or is it is it uh, is it is, is it techn technology or technique that you are trying to acquire something that you can acquire by employing someone, and then also um, what's the nature of these people? What are their the, whether they are they are aligned interests? Whether your your interests and that party's interests are aligned? Because if they are not aligned, you have problems from the one. And then lastly. Um, the form of the of the the arrangement, the agreement and documentation underlying the agreement that clearly states what every party's um, roles, um, objectives, responsibilities, obligations, etc., uh, etc., et uh, must be clearly must be clearly articulated, documented, and agreed to by all parties in writing. I think that's those are important. Okay, thank you. A major cause of post-harvest losses, especially in the fresh, fresh produce category, comes from poor storage and weak transportation system. And the cold chain is usually abused. Are there current efforts to invest in this space? I know Sahel Capital has done a lot of work on the livestock industry, the dairy. So if Ms. Moore can give us some information on this. Yeah, we're very keen on cold chain development and, you know, we, we very critical, very important. The people that have cold chain today, um, I, in the, I, I read a study recently that uh, a, a bulk of our cold chain is actually geared towards people who import uh, fish and other perishables into the country. So it's centered around the Lagos area. Um, and then outside of that, there's cold chain that some of the larger players have for their own use to move uh, perishables across the country. Um, all the large poultry players also have some cold chain because they're moving frozen chicken as well across the country. 
but unfortunately there is very limited if not any um, cold chain logistics for third party use or for um, small SME uh, business use. So I know with our dairy company in Kano, um, the, the, the company has had to build out their own um, cold chain logistics network to make sure that their dairy products can get to key stores and locations across the country. So it's very expensive to do, it's not sustainable, and ultimately there needs to be a player that provides this third party service. And we are looking very closely at, at the space because we think there, there is an opportunity here for somebody to do this effectively. Thank you. Um, the Land Use Act in Nigeria is not agricultural friendly. Where direct access to land is a challenge, how, land, how can land be made more readily available to those who want to put this to agricultural use? This is a question from Matizo. And, um, I think Azuka should answer this because he works for government. Um <laughs> 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 uh, with with Land Use Act, um we don't have much of experience um in that regard. But um, the only thing we know from from our operations is that it's easier uh, with some states, especially with some state uh, executive, to uh, not to see it, to sign titles uh, to to large farm holders. So when you, you you find some state governors who are willing, when we get to that stage, we say, look, this particular business or this customer is having issue with title. The governor says. This business, let me let me see it and they sign it. You know, the issue of title, uh, that's 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 the issue that we have occasionally, and it's all across the country, and it's by case by case study, uh, basis. It's not it's not uniform. Okay. We don't we don't go into the nitty gritty or legal, uh, you know, as regards uh, land use act. We don't do that. Okay. Thank you. You can you can communicate with um, Azuka um, on the on the webinar uh, Q and A session, so he will give you more insight into areas you need more clarification. Now mm -hmm. fish farming because we'll be rounding up soon. Ebele called out the need to develop capacity to reduce dependency on foreign species. That's in fish farming. From experience, commercial fish farming requires a lot of attention on disease management. What is the food industry's culture in relation to food safety? And are the current regulatory requirements sufficient? Ebele, that's for you. I mean, from, from, from our perspective, as a formal um, retail uh, industry player that is trying to build scale and, and operate at um, best global uh, standards and practices of operation. We, we, we tend to draw our own um, uh, standards, you know, from the international, what's available in the, in, in the, global, in the global market. Uh, to be quite frank, I don't believe that the Nigerian, I mean, the Nigerian regulatory system, particularly driven by um, NAFDAQ, um, I, you know, have done quite a bit, uh, but their focus, I think, predominantly has been with pro uh, packaged uh, products. And with the risk of drawing uh, attention to my industry, to now uh, invite people to start, uh, you know, getting antagonistic, I think there really is um, more that government can do to clearly define what the standards should be, and to then educate their uh, employees, their government workers, on how to monitor the implementation or, or compliance to those standards, working with players at various levels. Because you find that there's a lot of attention might be given to us former players, but 80% of food industry, particularly food retail, 
is in if informal sector. And those informal sectors, those guys get away with every and anything. They have no standards, no hygiene practices, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So for the little um, regulatory uh, supervision or visitations that we get, you know, in the industry, the focus is on on us, the former players, who are even trying to do the right thing. But 80% of the industry don't even know what the right thing is. You know, they, 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 they operate in the open air. Their products are, are, you know, exposed to the elements and exposed to all sorts of bacteria and things like that. And quite frankly, um, no one cares. The government officials actually don't care. So there's a lot of work that needs to be done um, from that perspective. Thank you. Um, uh, we're planning to round up. I'm going to ask each of the panelists to give them um, their parting comments and they should focus on their vision, what they hope to see, particularly as it relates to policy, whatever it is as it relates to policy. So they give their closing remarks. I will start with um, Mezwo. Can you give us your closing remarks? What are the, like, the high three points you want to be addressed um, by government? Sure. Policy, yeah. Yeah. If I, so I, 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 re, I mean, one intervention I think is very important is one I mentioned earlier, which is irrigation. Because I think that where the government can provide support is around areas that is very difficult for private sector and farmers to provide. And, um, and leave the other areas for the private sector. And if I was to pick one key thing, I would say that irrigation is something that small farmers would benefit from. It's almost impossible for a private sector to do for the small farmers themselves and would have huge ramifications on agriculture sector productivity. Uh, a second after that I would focus on is rural roads. And, um, you know, we, we only think about roads when we are traveling between states or going to our hometowns, but those rural roads are actually critical to ensure that the farmers can get their crops to consumers where they are. And yes, that um, financing solutions is important. The tire protection potentially is important. Um, uh, all the different policy. But um, I think it's we need to look at the harder things that are harder for private sector to engage in, and that's infrastructure related and any support that the federal state government can provide to these hard, difficult issues, I think would have a huge impact. Thank you. Um, Ebele? Yeah, thank you, Felicia. Um, there's so much talk about the potential of agriculture in Nigeria. Um, as long as agriculture is practiced predominantly at a subsistence level, with an aim to churn out commoditized products, uh, which are not plugged into a value chain um, for high value premium products, agriculture in Nigeria will not achieve its full potential. There is a need to, um, to stop thinking commodity when talking about agriculture and start thinking and, and talking finished processed products across the low, middle to high end segment of the consumer market. Um, there's, a need, there's a critical need to remove the opaque nature of the distribution system for agricultural products so that retailers can have access to distributors of a wider range of fresher products at the best possible prices. Uh, we, you know, if agriculture is one of those industries in Nigeria where you cannot actually determine who, how the products get from the farm to your shelf. It's amazing, and I don't understand what, why there's a lot of opaqueness or security as to as to who are those who bring those products, where those products are coming from, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, now there is a, there's an urgent need to remove. Uh, the land tenor system in Nigeria, sorry, to improve on the land tenor system in Nigeria in order to unlock the latent capital uh, within land ownership here. As long as ob obtaining COO is expensive and laden with bureaucracy, um, farmers will struggle to raise capital 
and move into a more mechanized system of farming. And lastly, we need um, creative solutions and structures to financing agricultural activities in Nigeria. Farm Crowdy, which is a crowdfunding um, you know, business for agri, has done a fantastic job um, and they've, they've done a, you know, brought in a new, a new system or a new idea of how things can be done. There are probably a lot of other ways things can be done suited for the Nigerian market. And, and that, I mean, those are my thoughts, um, you know, my closing remarks, of course, on the market. Thank you. Thank you. Azuka? Yes, thank you very much. Uh, so my first uh, thought would be to increase the capacity and knowledge of the operators. So uh, the operators should be aware of best practices, corporate governance, uh, financing options that are available out there, the next thought will be to establish a framework for sustainable financing uh, for the sub subsector. Say, for example, the anchor borrower scheme by the central bank. There should be credit lines uh, encouraged. Credit lines should be encouraged from uh, development banks like BOI and other commercial banks. The third point should be uh, increase in production activity or capacity across the industry, uh, which could be in form of advocating implementation of clusters and cottage industries to enable specialization and resource concentration, optimize government's current uh, scheme in distribution of inputs like fertilizers and seeds. Uh, Mesut talked about uh, wastage, uh, post-harvest uh, wastage. So the next one will be to reduce uh, reduction in post-harvest wastage or losses, uh, which we could do by establishing linkages between research institutions uh, production and processing lines, cluster for farmers, you know, for ease of input provi uh, pro uh, provision and shared storage or transport facilities. The last one will be for import substitution to facilitate off-grid uh, connectivity for processing plants in identified clusters. Processing is dependent on energy availability. Mesut well talked about energy, but he, he said he couldn't uh, talk much on that. So these are my points. These are some of my highlights or my takeaways. Thank you very much, panelists. Um, from my own end, I have a vision for a better Nigeria where agriculture will match international standards, where our yields in primary agriculture production will match the yields of the developed economies. My vision is for our processors to engage with farmers and ensure they have a close relationship with them, smallholder farmers that would provide them with their raw materials such that you know, the, 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 the losses that would have gone to middlemen would be out of the costs and then they get their raw materials at best prices. And then two, marketers, distributors, and those in the delivery and distribution business. My vision is for the government of Nigeria to improve on infrastructure, rail, road, and sea, because some produce can actually be moved around in their boats. For the government to pay a lot of attention on that so that we can scale up our distribution system in Nigeria. And finally, for policies, for our houses of assembly, the arm, of, um, the arm that makes the laws, to focus on developing laws that will alleviate the pains of the stakeholders in the agricultural sector. That's my parting message. I'm going to call on the chairman of um, IOD uh, Committee on Agriculture and agro Ally, Prince Bimbo Olashore, to give the closing remarks. Thank you, thank you, thank you very much, uh, Ms. Alatlanyo, and uh, to thank everybody for such an interesting uh, uh, session.
I think, uh, first of all, let me thank our past presidents, members of uh, Council of the Institute of Directors, and other members who are, who are on this uh, particular webinar, and in particular, all our guests that came in. I think, uh, judging from the questions uh, that, uh, that were sent, it, should, it was a very, a very attentive audience that we had, and thank you for making it extremely, extremely uh, interactive. Uh, first of all, uh, it's also to note that I'm also what I call a boarding uh, farmer with some baby steps in that uh, sector. And I'm going away with that idea from Israel, start small, start small. Or like I tell people, start small, but grow big fast. If not, you'll get uh, squashed. I think one thing that is quite key and has come out from this particular session is the need for government uh, to play a much more uh, a bigger role. Uh, all the issues that we have spoken about on infrastructure, I like the area of roads and irrigation to make transport costs a lot cheaper. These are all things that uh, the private sector cannot do, needs uh, government. I've taken the word from the president that we should try and bring in somebody that is in charge of policy and somebody that can answer on behalf of government to give us what they are doing to create a more positive and enabling environment. Especially look at the issues of uh, title, which we came up throughout our conversation, that obviously getting title differs across uh, the states and issue of standardization and how do you ensure compliance. So it's really to thank everybody uh, for being part of this, but let me also now close up by thanking our panelists starting from Mesra Minelli. Thank you very much for being part of this. When I first called you to join us on this, you instinctively immediately said yes, even despite all the delays and uh, postponements, you still find time to be, to be with us. Uh, we're all watching you and we're all thankful for what Sire uh, Capital is doing and your own intervention uh, in that particular area. You give some of us hope that we can all come from finance and move into the agri space and make uh, success uh, of it. The other two panelists, I'll see more as uh, our own in-house and members of my committee. Ebele coming in from uh, Potako, thank you very much uh, for joining us and sharing your own unique uh, perspective. Sometimes when we talk about agri, it's very easy to focus on those who are at the producing end and sometimes we're processing, but sometimes you must also remember those who are actually at the retailing uh, end. So we thank you for bringing the perspective from that, uh, from that uh, area. And congrats for what you are doing in your, in your space. Finally, on uh, Azuka Okofu. Well, I'll say you are with me. Uh, I'm from the banking sector. You obviously are on the difficult side. Anytime we do anything, they always say, bring in the bankers. And you directly mentioned finance is not the problem in our Greek. Finance is not a problem. The money is available. The question is to make sure you have a bankable project. And I like what you said, that every Tom Dick and Harry now, because of the focus on agri, now believes they can go into agri. I'm sure I was talking to me, because I'm an accountant. What am I doing with a farm? But like I said, I'll start with baby steps. And I think you also said it. Let's start small. Start with a few examples. You start in a way like so you learn before you can operate the bank who will now stake big money with you. So thank you, uh, Mr. Kofu, for being part of us. And finally, Ms. Alani, for always being there. You're also a member of my committee, but you're the one that comes in with our stability and knowledge in this particular uh, space. Thanks for moderating uh, this particular session and for keeping everybody on a leash and also to time. Well, I think we program about one and a half hours. We are slightly over, but I think it's because it's been extremely uh, interactive and useful for Everyone. So thank you, Zelania, for being a part of this. Now for some housekeeping, looking in-house, I've mentioned the president again. I must thank him for his uh, opening uh, uh, remarks and, uh, and his introduction of the panelists. Uh, thank you, Mr. President, for what you are doing in uh, positioning the Institute and making it much more relevant. Also to my other members of, my, of our committee, the agri and the uh, agri Committee, thank you for organizing this and being part of this. And also, obviously, must not forget the Secretariat, led by the DG, uh, Mr. Adele Alimi, for all the support for the infrastructure. And obviously, our own uh, Ime Bongokun, who works with the Secretariat, but just a member of my, of my committee. Thank you, Ime Bong, for putting uh, all this uh, uh, together. Uh, for me, it's to say I've thoroughly enjoyed this, uh, this, uh, this session. Uh, I'm also learning a bit. Like I said, I have my baby steps in there. And uh, I listen quite attentively to all the issues. Like we said, there are challenges in agri. 
But from a risk adjusted point of view, it's obvious that at the end of the day, it can be a very profitable business from, from what I can see on the robust cheeks of uh, Mezue and uh, Ebele. I'd like to join you also in that space. And thank you for mentioning that again, there are insurable uh, risk in there and letting us know that there's some areas in which we can actually ensure some of the risk and ensure that at the end of the day, you can come out uh, uh, well. So it's really to thank everybody, the audience and all our attendees for being part of this. I'm looking at the roll count. I can see, see we have uh, roughly still about 80 attendants still, still logged on. So it's also thank you for staying till the end uh, of this particular uh, webinar. And we look forward to welcoming you to another uh, quite interesting webinars. We are hoping it to be around the uh, risk management. Today I've spoken about the challenges and some of the issues. Now let's now go much more in depth or now you can mitigate some of the, those risks. And hopefully we'll also see whether we can get somebody in from the government side to address what government is doing exactly uh, in addressing some of the issues that have been mentioned every day as to what government will do, as to some of the things the private sector cannot do. You know, government is all about enabling the environment. So let's try and bring somebody in also that can tackle that. So from my end, is to thank everybody for being part of this. I will look forward to welcoming you again on, on our next series. Thank you, thank you, thank you very much. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Have yes. a good weekend. Same to you. Bye-bye.